Hello everyone! Thank you so much for tuning in today to hear what else I saw in February that I didn't already tell you about. Let's get on in there with movie number one, 1943's They Met in the Dark, a wartime thriller I found on YouTube in which James Mason plays a disgraced RAF officer who sets out to clear his name and stumbles on a spy ring. Along the way, a body is discovered, a body disappears, and a young lady who thinks he's the killer begins to trail him while he's trailing someone else. The whole thing gets rather elaborate and doesn't always connect the dots, but I liked it. Considering the similarities it bears to certain superior films, namely Alfred Hitchcock's The 39 Steps and The Lady Vanishes, one can't help imagining how well it might have fared in Hitchcock's hands. Probably the plot would have been tighter and more stable, and the humor and flirty romance would have sparkled more. Instead, this was directed by Carol Lamech, one of the few English-language films he made. Besides the story's tendency to jump around, the main weakness, I think, is the leading lady. I don't mean any disrespect to Joyce Howard, but her character is an annoying dimwit who has a knack for getting in the way. Still, there's good stuff here. The film isn't great, but it's fun and interesting, and Mason's heroic character is appealing, likable, and somehow always able to show up at the right place at the right time. Some of you know this already, but for the last four Saturdays, my friend Daisuke Beppu has been live-streaming a discussion on his channel of one of the original cast Star Trek films. Last month, he covered 1 through 4. Today, he's covering 5. Uh, depending on when I get this video up and when you see it, if you didn't know about that and you want to check it out, you might be able to catch it. And 6 will be next week. In anticipation of each discussion, I've been watching the films, which explains why there are three Star Trek movies on this list. I did also watch Star Trek The Motion Picture, but I think that was technically in January, and I ended up doing a solo review of it. These chats turned out to be a highlight of my month. Dice K has tremendous enthusiasm for these films, which is so infectious, and his ability to quote lines and imitate characters and recall minor details is impressive. He will tell you that his imitations are bad, but they're not. <laughs> it's also been fun and not a little surreal to see some of you pop up in the chat and say hello to me. It's it's been exciting to see names that I recognize, um, but it's also been, <laughs> you know, kind of, whoa, I'm talking to people. I'd never interacted with anyone in a live stream chat before, and I was nervous about it. But the warm welcome that I've gotten from Dice K, who, oh my goodness, has, has been so generous and thoughtful with his time giving me so many shout outs during these live streams I cannot thank him enough um, and everyone else uh, being so welcoming um, has really helped me ease into it although I still spend most of the time just watching and listening because that's what I do. <laughs> I'm grateful to Dice K for doing these live stream discussions and to his viewers for their insightful and humorous contributions because these chats have given me greater appreciation for these films. I knew that I liked them, but I didn't realize how much I liked them. That I am, in fact, a fan. <laughs> Anyway, movie number two is Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan from 1982. Officially, this was my fourth time seeing the movie, not counting the times when I was little that my siblings watched it and I hid behind the couch in fear. It's just a great movie all around. Intense, funny, scary, sad, exciting. The same things stand out to me that I think I talked about when I reviewed it back in 2016. How awesome all the literary references are, and the depth they add to the plot. What a great villain Khan is, with one of the great character reveals. And how underrated Ricardo Montalban was as a dramatic actor. You know that hypothetical question people ask sometimes? If you could invite ten people to dinner, living or dead, fictional or real, who would you choose? Um, <laughs> don't you think that Khan would be a fascinating dinner guest? <laughs> I was gonna say fun, but fun's probably not the right word. 
I just think he could expound on Moby Dick and King Lear and Paradise Lost and whatever else the small library on the Botany Bay was stocked with in the most amazing, charismatic way. He would quote at least half of Moby Dick, and that in and of itself would be impressive, but the insights that he could probably lend to all these other classic works would be incredible. Nobody else would want to come to this dinner party, though. <laughs> One thing I'm not sure I covered in my review is how moving the ending is. At that point, I hadn't revisited those scenes enough to know that they do, in fact, bring a tear to my eye every single time. It doesn't matter that I know how things turn out in later movies. The emotions in those moments are raw and powerful, and they always get me. Thanks to the characters, the dialogue, the story, Nicholas Meyer's direction, James Horner's thrilling score, the jaw-dropping imagery, and so much else, this has been, and always shall be, the best Star Trek movie. We'll get to the next Star Trek movie in a few minutes. Movie number three is 1997's Narrow Escape also known as A Thousand Men and a Baby, a TV movie based on a true story that a close friend told me was a Christmas favorite. I didn't get the chance to watch it at Christmas time, but fortunately, it's not so Christmassy that you can't watch it any other time of the year. The crew of a U.S. Navy ship in the last days of the Korean War ends up taking care of an abandoned half-Korean baby shortly before they're given orders to pull out. The men form an attachment to the child and thus become determined to find him a home. It's a touching movie with a lot of charm and humor. It's a little corny in spots, but it's cute and funny to see these sailors bending over backward to get the baby's attention, and there's at least one moment that really tugs on your heartstrings. Richard Thomas plays the ship's doctor, who reluctantly assumes charge of the baby's care, despite personal reasons for not wanting to get involved, and Gerald McRaney plays the captain. Jonathan Banks, Doris Roberts, and Eve Gordon also play key roles. Movie number four is 1954's Target Earth, a sci-fi film directed by Sherman A. Rose in which four people are bewildered to find themselves the only inhabitants of an abandoned city until they discover that they are not, in fact, alone. Target Earth is an adaptation of the short story Deadly City by Paul W. Fairman, which I read and discussed a few weeks ago. Those of you who saw that video may remember that while I thought the story was alright, I wondered if I might like the film better. Well, some things about the film are better, and some things about the story are better. The script made a number of changes, many of these doing away with things I hadn't liked, so that was an improvement. Like the story, the film has an eerie, empty quality, the disturbing quiet nicely emphasized in the opening scene by the juxtaposition of a ticking clock with a silent street outside. It seems the transition from page to screen was driven by two factors, need for filler and low budget. To make the film longer, a military subplot was added in which a scientist played by Whit Bissell tries to figure out how to defeat the invaders. This subplot isn't nearly as interesting as the human conflict unfolding in the city, and money, or lack thereof, demanded heavy use of stock footage to imply military might. It also takes away some of the mystery about the invaders, which are shown not too frequently, but too much to allow this discount race of robots to maintain a scrap of dignity. Apparently, the best they could afford to come up with was this wonderfully clunky design that I could probably recreate with stuff in our basement. Still, warts and all, this is a fun sci-fi film, and they had the sense to keep it relatively short. I also appreciate Richard Denning's presence. He was always a good sport about being in movies like this and gave them his best effort, which is classy. Movie number five is 1944's 2000 Women, a British war film about British women living in occupied France who are rounded up by the Nazis and placed in a grandiose old hotel turned internment camp. Their wits are tested when a few RAF pilots crash nearby and turn up seeking a place to hide. This is a very enjoyable film. The characters are lively and unique personalities, most of them likable, and there's a refreshing realness about their interactions. 
Things move quickly, and much of the dialogue and craftiness is humorous. You've just got to stay on your toes to catch it all. I found this on YouTube after seeing it on a list of underrated old World War II movies. And while the quality's not the best, it's watchable, and more than that, it's worth it. The only negative is that the ending is rather abrupt. The film is in such a rush to wrap things up, they were left to assume something which in reality would be far from guaranteed. But otherwise, I thought this was really good, well made, with some tense sequences, and while it's definitely not a comedy, it's witty with a couple unexpected hilarious moments. By the way, all of the last three movies, Narrow Escape, Target Earth, and 2000 Women, were on YouTube. They might still be on YouTube, I don't know, and I definitely can't guarantee that they will continue to be on YouTube because YouTube has been cracking down on the films that are, let's face it, illegally uploaded here. Um, I have a playlist of movies I've found that I wasn't able to find anywhere else that I have been hoping to get to, and I've been very motivated to watch these movies because I noticed that they started disappearing. And I don't know what movies are no longer on the list. I wish I had written them down somewhere else. I have since done that, just in case something disappears so that I can try to find it again. But let that be a warning to you to um, be similarly motivated, because you might have something that you're really anxious to get to, and you go to watch it and it's gone. Movie number six is 1984's Star Trek III The Search for Spock. This was a rewatch, but it's only the second time I've seen it, officially. Last time, when I reviewed it, I'm afraid I treated it kind of like an obligatory stepping stone to get to Star Trek IV, which I love. And I think the brevity of my old review of it reflects my attitude. I regret that, because I liked this movie much more on second viewing. It probably helped that in this case, I ended up watching it after Dice K's discussion, so I had his and others' positive observations ringing in my ears. Star Trek III isn't nearly as popular as Star Trek II or Star Trek IV, but it is an essential part of the story, the somber middle act of a trilogy. While I still don't consider it a favorite, and probably never will, it has many wonderful scenes, interactions, and visuals. The sequence where they steal the Enterprise is fantastic, and it never gets old. Kirk's meeting with Spock's father is powerful and quietly emotional, and the self-destruct countdown is pretty awesome. I think, too, that there's a good deal of unappreciated humor in this entry, showing that the characters are still themselves despite the tragic losses they've recently suffered, and continue to suffer, in Kirk's case. If you're looking for fast-paced fun and excitement, an action movie like Star Trek II, this might not be your cup of tea, and I think my enjoyment of it is hampered because the main trio is so fractured. Spock's gone, Kirk's depressed, and McCoy's kind of out of his mind, or rather dealing with his mind and Spock's. Bones is almost always my favorite, and DeForest Kelly is especially great here. I love his scene in the bar, and his rueful acknowledgement that he does care for Spock despite their argumentative history. It all goes to reinforce the theme of friendship, which dominates the trilogy. The film, which was directed by Leonard Nimoy by the way, has its flaws, and there are parts I don't like so much, but the positives of the film outweigh the negatives. There are plenty of quotable lines, and that ending is just great. Movie number seven was another rewatch of a movie I've previously reviewed, 1944's Lara, the Otto Preminger directed noir about a murder investigation that takes a strange turn when it's revealed the murder victim was misidentified. I love this movie. Gene Tierney and Dana Andrews are both great here and also never looked better. The supporting cast, comprised of Clifton Webb, Vincent Price, and Judith Anderson, is a treat. I love the wit and the little touches you pick up on with multiple viewings, the subtle and somewhat unbelievable romance, the outfits, Laura's hairstyles, the catchy song, and I love that interrogation scene. There are so many little things going on there, so many things boiling under the surface, and I love the way it's lit, and how it's staged and everything. It's just uh, a great scene, my favorite scene from a favorite movie. 
Movie number eight is 1986's Star Trek IV The Voyage Home. Also directed by Leonard Nimoy, this one is actually tied with Star Trek II for personal favorite for me. It's such a marvelously entertaining movie, and I have to feel a little suspicious of anyone who doesn't like it. What's not to like? Sure, there are parts, especially in the first half hour, 45 minutes, where I'm not sure what's going on, what people are talking about, what I'm looking at, but this movie is fun. Every single character is great and gets a chance to shine, the story is ridiculous and awesome, and the interactions are so good from heartwarming to laugh out loud funny. In addition, it has fine cameos from both Mark Leonard and Jane Wyatt returning as Spock's parents. It has good effects for the whales and the impressive Klingon bird of prey, and Catherine Hicks makes a perfect addition to the cast. Having seen 3 again just before this, I recognize even more now how important it is to take 2 through 4 as a trilogy. If you haven't seen its predecessor, so much of the depth, the character development, the conflict generated by Spock's odd behavior, and the predicament of the crew of the Enterprise will be lost on you. The good news is, this film is so accessible that even if you aren't familiar with the previous film, and I wasn't when I saw this as a kid, the scenes of our heroes clashing with the culture of 1980s San Francisco are still hilarious. That stuff never stops being funny, and the whole main chunk of the movie is just a riot. Movie number 9 is 1947's Ramrod a film that combines a western setting with a film noir plot starring Joel McRae and Veronica Lake and directed by Andre de Toth. A headstrong young woman goes against her father and the local big shot who wants to marry her after they run her fiancé out of town by claiming his ranch is her own and provoking a nasty land war. But the foreman, a recovering alcoholic who agrees to help her, insists on fighting their enemies through strictly legal means. If that sounds confusing to you, imagine how I felt watching the movie, especially where it feels like it drops you into the story with the first ten pages of the script cut out. Confusing initiation aside, though, I didn't care much for this one. It had two shots that I thought were noteworthy, and Joel McRae plays a nice, honest guy, but there was an awful lot of devious chicanery going on, and I just didn't find it that interesting. I mainly got it out of curiosity to see how Veronica Lake would handle the role if she'd be different in a western, but her character is really just a 19th century variation on a 20th century femme fatale, and I've seen her play that part. Her hair is magnificent, though. Hey, Editing Weaselberry here to acknowledge that expectations did play a role in how I reacted to this movie. I went into it looking for one kind of story, and instead got something I wasn't really in the mood for, and of course that affected my response to it. I'd also like to mention, first, that this was a second pairing of McRae and Lake, who had starred together previously in the 1941 comedy Sullivan's Travels. And for another movie where Lake gets to play against type, you might check out the 1943 war film So Proudly We Hail. Movie number 10 is 2021's Old, the latest effort from M. Night Shyamalan in which a collection of vacationers at a resort are dropped off for a day at a private beach, only to find that something there is making them age at an accelerated rate, and they are not able to leave. I hadn't heard any ringing endorsements of this movie when it came out, so I wasn't interested in watching it, but when I mentioned it to my mom, she really wanted to see it, and, well, I don't like to let her down. Unfortunately, I did not enjoy the movie. Um, the premise is interesting, but the execution, the dialogue, when you can understand it over the background noise, is often awkward, either too on the nose or just unrealistic. The acting is inconsistent, characters are one-dimensional with vague motivations, their interactions are bizarre, the editing was messy, the pacing was too fast, and the film ends up trying to outdo itself with one ridiculous over-the-top moment after another. And I get that that's the point, all these events are unfolding in such quick succession that the panicking and confused characters can't keep up with it or cope, but the viewer needs some logical story beats to process things once in a while, or else it's just a parade of absurdities. Shyamalan wrote, produced, and directed this, in addition to playing a small but pivotal role as he usually does, 
It was based on a graphic novel, so perhaps he's only partially to blame for the clunky dialogue, but he bears all responsibility for the way it was filmed. And the almost incompetent direction surprises me because Shyamalan's not a new kid on the block, yet I disagreed with and hated so many of his choices with regard to framing, staging, and camera movement. There are some disturbing and grotesque images in this movie, but somehow it manages to go too far and not far enough. Some of the aging makeup and effects were actually pretty good, but in 2021, with CGI and deep fakes and all of that, I expected to be blown away with some amazingly realistic details. I'm talking really fine stuff, really gradual changes. But even that, the main element of the movie was poorly handled. There were missed opportunities, some characters seemed neglected, and some factors of age seemed to have been forgotten about. It wasn't all awful. It held my attention, even though I was rolling my eyes a lot of the time, and the poster art is creatively creepy, and the morphing font in the main titles is cool, and the casting department did a good job uh, choosing people to play the children at different stages, and some of the ideas at the end are kind of intriguing. It's too bad they're just rushed in there. The good news, though, is that my mom did enjoy the movie, and at the end of the day, that's all that really matters, that she had a good time watching the movie that she was looking forward to seeing. And number 11 is one more movie that we watched on YouTube, 1937's Nonstop New York, starring Anna Lee and John Loder. This was a viewer recommendation, a relatively short but very entertaining film with an interesting storyline involving a gangster, a murder, a falsely convicted man, and a young woman who can exonerate him if only she can get someone to believe her story. It sounds serious, but while it is technically a crime drama, it's a fun one. The dialogue is witty, the cast is full of colorful, likable characters, and the second half boasts a fantastic setting, a transatlantic aircraft complete with a dining room, an observation deck, and private cabins for each of the passengers. What a way to travel! Anna Lee sparkles, John Loder is charming, and Francis Sullivan, with his deceptively mellifluous speaking voice, makes a good villain. Like the first film on this list, it has a 1930s Hitchcock feel. It even has some alumni from his 1936 film Sabotage. But director Robert Stevenson does a very fine job of his own, and I especially appreciated the quick but steady pace and the tight editing. The only downside is that right now the only version that exists, or at least is available, is the low quality print you can find on YouTube. While it's obviously watchable, the film's in sore need of a restoration. But poor quality aside, it's a very good film, and I enjoyed it a lot, and I hope someone will release a cleaned-up print someday. And that covers everything else I saw last month. I hope you enjoyed the collection. Let me know what you think of any of these movies if you've seen them in the comments below, and go ahead and share what you've been watching lately, and I'll see you again soon! Thanks for watching!